how's everyone doing? Great, yeah. Um, cool, my name is Jacob, and I work at a company called Chase, um, or Chase International, um, and I'm a React Native engineer. Um, we launched our bank um, about three and a half years ago uh, in the UK, and one of the things we think a lot about at work is, of course, uh, mobile application security. So during this talk, we're going to talk a bit about um, what is app security. Um, we're going to also look at how to build a secure app in React Native and maybe why Expo and Greenfield apps are not the best choice uh, to use when thinking about security and why native apps and maybe brownfield apps um, are a bit better. And then at the end, we're going to kind of ignore what I've said in the second part, and then we're going to do all of this using Expo. Um, first, I just want to talk a bit about uh, kind of why we would do Expo versus native. So um, Expo, of course, is super easy to uh, maintain and scale when it comes to your project. Uh, with Expo, you're writing code once, and you can deploy it to all your platforms. It also has something called continuous native generation, which means that you're not even uh, maintaining the projects, your native projects. Uh, these are automatically generated every time you do a build. On the other side of this diagram, uh, we have native apps. So obviously, native apps is more complex and more difficult to maintain, because you literally have to build them um, each for each platform. And somewhere in the middle, you have brownfield apps. So Brownfield apps are basically native apps that, at some point of uh, the app lifecycle, initializes uh, some React Native journeys. Uh, some people think that's like the best of the both worlds. For me, who spend most of my days working on Brownfield apps, I think it has a lot of the good things from React Native, but kind of with the maintenance of a native app. Um, so when you're looking at this graph here, it's quite easy to think, OK, we're going to go with an Expo app. But when it comes to app security, um, it's actually a bit reversed. So in JavaScript-based applications, uh, security is actually uh, a lot weaker. And with native ones, uh, we have a lot more security features. So let's look a bit more at that. Um, I'm going to focus on a few different points. Uh, the first one is code exposure. So in React Native, we're writing our apps in uh, JavaScript. And JavaScript is easier to reverse engineer. Um, so this means that um, our, our JavaScript code is easier for attackers to kind of inspect and tamper with. Uh, we're also packaging our JavaScript code inside of the app, which means that we're also more sus susceptible to things like uh, code injection and tampering and debugging. While on native, uh, our code gets compiled down into binary code. So that's our uh, APK files, our IPA files. And for this reason, um, well, native code or binary code is much, much more difficult to reverse engineer. And so it's, it's much better for uh, intellectual property protection and logic obfuscation. Another thing is our runtime environment. So obviously, when we're writing things in JavaScript, uh, this is, uh, it, it runs on, on the uh, JavaScript virtual machine. So we're adding a layer of abstraction where additional vulnerabilities can be introduced. Uh, we're also opening up uh, ourselves to more things like runtime injections um, because, um, uh, because we've added this additional layer. Um, and on native, uh, we're you know, operating directly on the native runtime. So um, obviously, we, we don't have those risks that are introduced by our additional layers of abstractions. Uh, thirdly, we have our platform-specific security features. So obviously, with React Native, um, we don't have access to all of the platform-specific um, security features that, um, that we do on native. Uh, or at least not by default. So we often have to use third-party libraries or write our own native modules. Um, and even if we're using third-party libraries, we might not have that granular control over those security features. On native, we can obviously utilize the full OS-level security features. 
Um, with JavaScript, we're also quite heavily reliant on, on third-party packages. And these packages can be uh, you know, outdated or poorly maintained. Uh, so when, when you know, new vulnerabilities are introduced, it might take a while before they are actually uh, fixed. And we're also uh, more uh, susceptible to supply chain attacks, uh, unless we, we can control and audit our, our open search or third-party libraries. On native, to be honest, they're also using quite a lot of uh, third-party libraries, but often not as many. And um, they more times also rely on platform-specific uh, SDKs, which usually have better maintenance and quicker security updates. Um, and then lastly, on React Native, um, we can do obfuscation and we can do like app protection, uh, but it requires additional tools like um, the Metro Bundle Obfuscator and uh, other JS obfuscators. Uh, and unfortunately, they're also weaker in protection. So even though we can obfuscate, uh, it's still possible to, to reverse engineer them. Um, native apps have stronger obfuscation tools, so Android apps can be pro-guarded, um, iOS app can be bit code compiled, and you can even use additional tools on top of that. Um, so when it comes to companies that prioritizes security features, uh, because of you know, the stricter runtime controls and the harder to reverse binaries and the direct access to security features, uh, the choice is often to go to native apps or uh, to do some kind of where you write your secure code on the native side. So Today, we're going to try and make a secure app in, uh, in React Native. And I just made up some security requirements here. So we're going to have uh, authentication of the app. Um, so only authenticated users can use this app. Uh, and then those users can fetch things over network, and then they can store this data uh, in the app. So when it comes to authentication, we want the authentication to happen before the uploads. And we want this to be in, on a native screen because of the risk of reverse engineering. Uh, we also might do things like you know, security industry standard protocols, uh, use biometrics, or maybe device binding. We then have our storage. So with the storage, um, that should only be uh, open for the people of, or for the user who has authenticated. Um, we should encrypt our data, of course, and we should use hardware-backed uh, security features to do this. And then lastly, with the networking, we should encrypt our networking, of course. We should do things like TLS certificate pinning. Um, and then obviously, all of our uh, network requests needs to be authenticated. So we need to have that uh, a token passed to the backend. If you draw this app as a diagram, it would look something like this. So the app launches. We have some kind of native screen um, that blocks the app from loading. And then once that um, is done, we have our app experiences. And then the app can uh, kind of use the security features through our native modules. And I think already, if you're looking at this diagram, you can see that um, it already starts looking like a brownfield app, because we have all of this native UI before the app starts. But then a, another thing is that um, all of these native modules need to be aware of each other. So usually when we're writing native modules, they're done in separation. They're very modularized. But when it comes to this, um, obviously our storage needs to be aware if the user is authenticated. And our networking needs to get the token from the secure storage. So we need to have a... a some kind of common area here. And we can't pass this back and forward uh, to, to the JavaScript side, because then again, uh, we're opening up ourselves to reverse engineering. So we'll have something like a secure core. And this is also a problem in, in Greenfield apps, because and I, I'm going to show you with an example. Um, I hope you can see it. Um, but basically, we have two of these as expo modules. So the first is our authentication module. and. The authentication module does something like starting an, uh, an activity for the native UI. And then it has, you can see in the, in the beginning, a, the secure core. It has an instance of the secure core so that um, the authentication um, form uh, can authenticate with uh, the secure core. And then we can send the state of that back to React Native, uh, basically, if you've been authenticated or not. 
And then we have a storage module, and it also has an instance of our secure core. So um, when we're getting things, we're getting it from this instance of the core. Now, this is basically how this would look like if we're running this app. So we're getting some data from secure core. It doesn't work because you're not authenticated. So you authenticate, but you still can't get anything because both of these modules have different instances of secure core. And so this is usually when, uh, when we turn to, to brownfield apps because then uh, you have this um, better way of customizing your app logic because you're, you're actually using the whole app, right? You're, you're writing the whole app on the native side. But we want to do this with Expo. So this is where Expo modules and config plugins come into play. Um, I'm actually going to show this instead of talking about it. So people can see my code? Yes. So this is the project. So at Chase, we use micro front ends. So this is a typical monorepo structure. You can see I have my apps here. My secure app is the one we're writing right now. And then we have our packages, which is our three Expo modules and one Kotlin module and one Swift module for, for the secure core features. Um, I'm actually going to show you this in Android Studio now. Um, I'm going to do everything in Kotlin today because we don't have time to do, to do both Swift and, and Kotlin. Um, and also, I couldn't be bothered writing all the Swift code for this talk, but um, I will upload it later on, so I will share a link to all the code later. Um, so yeah, this is the, um, how Android Studio looks like. I don't know if a lot of people work in Kotlin or Android Studio, but uh, this is how it looks like. Um, and basically, here we have our app. Um, and again, with Expo, this is the part that kind of gets generated every time you do a build. Here we have our um, Expo modules. So these have been auto-linked, and they, they show up in Android Studio because of uh, you know, Gradle syncing. Um, so if I'm showing you the authentication module, it's the one that's already open, uh, you can see here that I start by uh, accessing our secure core. But I'm no longer uh, creating an instance of the secure core. I'm injecting an instance of the secure core um, using something called Coin. Uh, so Coin is a dependency um, framework or dependency injection framework for Kotlin. And, um, it basically means that I can inject uh, an instance of, of, of the secure core here. And then you can see that I am also firing off a, a new activity. So if we're trying this in the app, again, we can try and access the secure core. Um, it doesn't work because I'm not authenticated. So when I hit add authentication, it opens a completely native UI. And then if we're looking at the, the secure core module, or the, sorry, the storage module, Here, uh, you can see we're, again, using an instance that is in injected into the module. So when I'm setting the secure store value, it now works. And even though these are completely two different mo uh, modules, uh, they're sharing one instance of our secure core. But how does that work? Because I'm injecting an instance, but where does this instance come from? So it comes from the app. So when I'm creating my app, I actually need to create and set up coin with the instance that I want to use. So in the main application, you can see here in the onCreate method, I'm starting coin, and I'm providing all of my coin modules. Um, and the coin modules right now is just one single instance of a secure core. And same with the native UI. All of the native UI exists in my, uh, in my Expo module, but somehow the application needs to be aware of this so it can actually show it. And so I've added that in the Android manifest as well. But all of this will be generated again when I build the app. So everything I've created in the app file or in the app directory will be removed and be replaced by the template from Expo. So how does that work? This is where we use Expo plugins. So I'm going back to JavaScript land now, so back to VS Code. If you're looking at one of my Expo modules here, I have the Android code here. Um, and this is the same that we saw in um, Android Studio. But I also have my plugins. So config plugins is basically uh, the way Expo applies native logic after the pre-build. So here we have a coin plugin that I wrote. Well, actually, ChatGDP wrote it. Um, it's really good at writing Expo plugins. 
Uh, and you can see all the code I needed to initialize a coin and, and start my coin module. And so what it does is, after it's uh, generated my new build, it will then apply these changes onto the main activity. And same with the, uh, the activity that I was showing, uh, the, the login form. So this one registers this one in the Android manifest. So even though I'm continuously generating this, all the changes that I need for my app to set up all the shared instances um, and everything else can still be applied. Before I finish this demo, I also want to show you one more thing, and that's the actual JavaScript app. So in the app, um, this app that I was showing on the, on the side here, you can see that I have this authentication button. And the authentication button press, has an on press, which then calls the authenticate method. And this authenticate method is just the authenticate method from the expo module. And as you can see, I'm not passing anything. In fact, if someone reverse engineered this JavaScript bundle, the only thing they will know is that when someone presses the authenticate button, we're calling an authenticate method. All the logic between even the UI that I was displaying, how it unlocks the secure store, is still on the native side. And we can protect it there uh, with all the, the ways we protect it on native. So to summarize, um, today, because of Expo modules and Expo plugins, we can basically do everything we can do in Brownfield and native apps. Now, just one note on this. A lot of the things that we have to do at the bank is because we have highest priority on security. But not every app needs this. And it's up to you to determine what kind of threat model uh, your app has and what risk you can accept. Uh, for us, it would be very, very dangerous if people got access to our customers' data. But another app might have, you know, using public data that they're displaying in their app. And using something like a secure store then might be overkill. It might also have drawbacks like performance, for example. So it's up to you to, to kind of evaluate what level of security you need for your app. Um, the second thing is use third party libraries. If you don't have these very, very strict requirements, there's still things you can do to, to uh, kind of secure your app. So there's, if we're talking about storage, you can use things like um, Expo Secure Store or React Native MMKV. Uh, if you're doing biometrics, you can use React Native Biometrics, I think, or um, Expo Local Authentication. Um, there's a lot of these libraries. And if you don't want to spend a lot of time but still just add a little bit of security, uh, you can do that using third-party libraries. And lastly, it's about, I think it's a PR open for React Native right now. It's called Static Hermes. And Static Hermes will actually change a lot of these things. Um, Static Hermes is the next generation of the Hermes engine. And it does a lot of the things here that I've been talking about, uh, but for our JavaScript side. So it's basically bringing a lot of uh, the JavaScript and React Native world closer to how we do it on native. It's not going to be a one-to-one -one thing. So certain companies will still need to take additional steps. But it's definitely uh, bringing us in the right direction. There's a lot more things to say about security. And I have added a lot of them to my uh, GitHub repo. Um, I also have some uh, links to, uh, to this talk, to, to all the code, uh, and also to my social media if anyone wants to talk more about this. You can also catch me around here after this. And I think that's it for me. Um, I hope I have kind of uh, taught everyone a bit about the kind of things that we have to think about when you're working uh, at a company that uh, has the highest requirement on, on security. And uh, yeah, thank you for listening. And enjoy the rest of your conference.